the God in you. The Declaration of Independence starts with the preamble that all men are born free and equal. But how many believe that? When one child is born in a Park Avenue home, with doctors, nurses, and servants to attend to his slightest want, with tutors and colleges to educate him, with riches and influence to start him in his career, how can he be said to be born equal to the child of the ghetto, who has difficulty getting enough air to breathe, to say nothing of food to eat? And whose waking hours are so taken up with the struggle for existence that he has no time to acquire much in education? Yet in that which counts most, these two are born equal, for they have equal access to the God in themselves, equal chance to give him means of expression. More than that, the God in one is just as powerful as the other, for both are part of that all-powerful God of the universe who rules the world. In effect, we are each of us individual cells in the great mind of the universe, the God mind. We can draw upon the mind of the universe in exactly the same way that any cell in our own body draws upon our brain for whatever it needs outside its immediate surroundings. All men are born free and equal, just as all the cells in your body are equal. Some of these cells may seem to be more fortunately situated than others, being placed in fatty portions of the body where they are so surrounded with nourishment that they seem assured of everything they can need for their natural lives. Others may be in hard-worked parts where they continually have to draw upon the lymph around them, and throw it upon the bloodstream and the heart, and where it seems as though they cannot be sure of sustenance from one day to the next. Still, others may be in little used and apparently forgotten parts where they seem to have been left to dry up and starve, as in the scalp of the head when the hair falls out, and the fatty tissue of the scalp dries, leaving the cells there to shrivel and die. Yet despite their apparent differences in surroundings and opportunity, all these cells are equal, all can draw upon every element in the body for sustenance and need. To see how it is done, let us take a single nerve cell in our own brain and see how it works. Look up the diagram of a typical nerve cell in any medical work, and what do you find? From one side of the cell, a long fiber extends, which makes a connection with some part of the skin or some group of cells such as a muscle. This fiber is part of the nerve cell. It is the telephone line, carrying orders or stimuli from the cell to the muscle it controls or from the sensory nerve in the skin to the cell in the brain. Thoughts, emotions, and desires all send impulses to the nerves controlling the muscles concerned and provide the stimuli which set these muscles in action, thus transforming nervous energy into muscular energy. So if you have a desire which requires the action of only a single muscle, what happens? Your desire takes the form of an impulse to the nerve cell controlling that muscle. The order travels along with the cell fiber to the muscle, which promptly acts in accord with the stimulus given it. And your desire is satisfied. But suppose your desire requires the action of more than one muscle? Suppose it needs the united power of every muscle in the body? So far, we have used only the long nerve fiber or telephone line connecting the nerve cell with the muscle it controls. But on the other side of each nerve cell are short fibers, apparently ending in space. And as long as the nerves are at rest, these fibers do lie in space. But when you stir up the nerve cells, when you give them a job that is greater than the muscles that their command can manage, then these short fibers go into action. Then they bestir themselves to some purpose. They dig into the nerve cells near them. They wake these and stimulate them, in turn, to stir up those on the other sides of them until, if necessary, every cell in the brain is twitching and every muscle in the body working to accomplish the job you demand. That is what happens in your body if even a single cell in your brain desires something strongly enough, persistently enough, to hold to its purpose until it gets what it wants. And that is what happens in the God body when you put the same persistence into your desires. You see, you are a cell in the God body of the universe, just as every cell in you is a part of your body. When you work with your hands, your feet, and your muscles, you are using only the muscles immediately connected with your brain cells. When you work with the money you have, the riches or friends or influence you control, you are using only the means immediately connected to your brain cell and the mind of God. And that is so infinitesimally small a part of the means and resources at the command of that great God mind. It is just as though you tried to do all the work required of your body today by using only the tiniest muscle in your little finger, when by stirring up the surrounding nerve cells, you could just as well draw upon the power of the whole mind, or of the entire body if that were needed. It is as though one of your nerve cells undertook to do the work of the whole body and tried, with a single muscle at its command, to do it. You'd think that foolish if one tiny nerve cell out of the billions in your brain undertook any such gigantic job. You'd know it was hopeless. That no one cell, 
and no one muscle, could ever accomplish all that work. Yet you, as a single cell in the God mind, have often attempted just as impossible jobs. When all you had to do to accomplish everything you desired was to stir into action the cells around you. How can you do this? In the same way that any cell in your own brain does it. Pray. In other words, get an urgent, insistent desire. The first principle of success is desire, knowing what you want. Desire is the planting of your seed. It needs cultivation, of course, but the first important step is the planting. Desire stirs the nerve cells in your brain to use the muscles under their control to do the work required of them. Desire will set your nerve cell in the God mind vibrating, using the muscle under its command and stirring into action all the nerve cells around it until they, too, are working with you to bring about the thing you wish. That is the reason it was said in the Vedas thousands of years ago that if any two people would unite their psychic forces, they could conquer the world. That is the reason Jesus told us, if two of you shall agree is touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done unto them. For when two or three are gathered together in my name, there am in the midst of them, and I shall grant their request. When two or more nerve cells unite for a certain action, they get that action, even if to bring it about, they have to draw upon every cell in the whole body for help. This does not mean that anything is impossible to a single cell or a single person, merely that when two or more are united for a common purpose, the results are easier. But there is no good thing any man can ask, believing, that he cannot get. In the first chapter of Genesis, it is written that God gave man dominion over the earth. And it is true. It is just as true that any nerve cell in your whole body has dominion over your body. If you doubt it, let one nerve be sufficiently irritated, and see how quickly it puts every nerve in your body to work to remove that irritation. One nerve cell in your body, with a strongly held purpose, can bring into action every cell in your body to accomplish that purpose. One nerve cell in the God body, in other words, one man or woman, with a strongly held purpose can bring into action every cell in the universe if these be necessary to the accomplishment of that purpose. Does that mean anything to you? Does it mean anything to know that the words of prophets and seers are true, that the promises of the scriptures can be depended upon, that there really is a power in the universe that responds to the urge of the lowliest man or woman just as readily as to the command of the highest? The world is yours. It matters not whether you be prince or pauper, blue-blooded or red, white-skinned, black, yellow or brown. The God body of the universe makes no more distinction between cells than do you in responding to the impulses of the nerve cells in your own body. Rich or poor, it's all one to you. Highly placed or low, one can cause you as much trouble or give you as great satisfaction as another. And the same is true of the God body of the universe. All men are created free and equal. All remain free and equal nerve cells in the God mind of the universe. The only difference lies in our understanding of the power that is ours. How much understanding have you? And what are you doing to increase it? Seek first understanding, and all things else shall be added unto you. Easier to believe that now, isn't it? With the right understanding, you could run the world. Can you think of anything more important than acquiring understanding? What turned the complaining, discouraged, poverty-stricken, and quite ordinary young Bonaparte into the greatest military genius of his age, man of destiny and master of most of Europe. The talisman of Napoleon, the talisman of every great and successful man, the only talisman that will stir the whole body of the universe into action, is the same talisman as that needed to put the entire physical body at the service of any one nerve cell, a purpose so strongly held that life or death or anything else seems of small consequence beside it. A purpose, and the persistent determination to hold to it until it is accomplished. Love sometimes makes such a talisman, a love that goes out to dare all and do all for the loved one. Greed oftentimes brings it into being, hence many of the great fortunes of today. The lust for power is a potent talisman that has animated men since time began. Greater still is the zeal of one who would convert the world. That talisman, has carried men through fire and flood, into every danger and over every obstacle. Look how Muhammad, a lowly camel driver, became the ruler of and prophet to millions. Faith in charms, belief in luck, utter confidence in another's leadership, all are talismans of greater or lesser power. But the greatest of all is belief in the God inside you. Belief in its power to draw to itself every element it needs for expression. Belief in a definite purpose it came here to fulfill, and which can be fulfilled only through you. Have you such a faith? If not, get it. For without such a faith, life is purposeless, meaningless. What is more, until you lay hold of that talisman, 
life will never bring anything worthwhile to you won what was it won for Grant over his more brilliant opponents. The grim, dogged, persistent purpose to fight it out along those lines if it took all summer. What is it that has made England victor in so many of her wars, in spite of inept leadership and costly blunders? That same bulldog determination that holds on in spite of all reverses and discouragements until its fight is won. What was it that wore out the unjust judge in the parable that Jesus told? And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that man ought always to pray, and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man, and there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me on mine adversary. And he would not do for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubled me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bears long with them? If the nerve in the tooth keeps crying out that a cavity in that tooth needs attention, won't you finally drop everything and seek out a dentist who can satisfy that nerve's needs? And if any other nerve prays continuously for attention, won't you do likewise with it? Well, you are a nerve in the God body. If you have an urgent need and keep praying and insisting and demanding the remedy, don't you suppose you will get it just as surely? A definite purpose, held to in the face of every discouragement and failure, in spite of all obstacles and opposition, will win no matter what the odds. It is the one nerve cell working against the indifference, the inertia, or even the active opposition of the entire group. If the cell is easily discouraged, it will fail. If it is willing to wait indefinitely, it will have to wait. But if it keeps stirring up the cells next to it, and stimulating them to stir those beyond, eventually the entire nerve system will go into action and bring about the result that a single cell desires, even if it is only to rid itself of the constant irritation. You have seen young fellows determined to go to college. You have thought them foolish in the face of the obstacles facing them. Yet when they persisted, you know how often those obstacles have, one by one magically disappeared, until presently they found themselves with the fruition of their desires. A strongly held purpose persisted in, believed in, is as sure to win in the end as the morrow's sun is to rise. An earnest prayer is to the God body what a throbbing nerve is to yours. Hold to it, insist upon it, and it is just as sure of a hearing. But remember, he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. All are born free and equal. Al may not start with the same amount of wealth or opportunity immediately available to them, but all can go to the source of these and get just as much of them as is necessary to satisfy their desires. We are surrounded by riches. We have available unlimited wealth. But we have to learn how to draw it to us. Years ago, at Kimberley in South Africa, a poor Boer farmer tried to glean a living out of the rocky soil. His boys oftentimes picked up pieces of dirty-looking crystal and used them as pebbles to throw at some wandering sheep. After years of fruitless effort, the farmer abandoned his attempts to make a living out of this rocky soil and moved to a more fertile spot. Today, the farm he tried so hard to cultivate is the site of the Kimberley Diamond Mines, one of the richest spots on the face of the globe. And the bits of dirty crystal that his boys threw at the sheep turned out to be diamonds in the rough. Most of us are like that poor boar farmer. We strive and struggle and frequently give up, because of ignorance of our powers, and ignorance of the good things around us. We remain in poverty until along comes someone and shows that we were standing on a diamond mine all the time. Russell Conwell tells the story of a Pennsylvania farmer whose brother went to Canada and became an oil driller. Fired by the brother's tales of sudden wealth, the farmer sold his land and went to Canada to make his fortune. The new owner, looking over the farm, found that where the cattle came to drink from a little creek, a board had been put across the water to hold back a heavy scum which was washed down by the rains from the ground above. He examined this scum and thought it smelled like oil. So he had some experts come out and look the ground over. It proved to be one of the richest oil fields in the state of Pennsylvania. What riches are you overlooking? What opportunities? Opportunity, says a famous writer, is like oxygen. It is so plentiful that we fairly breathe it. All that is necessary is a receptive mind, a willingness to try, and the persistence to see things through. There is one thing that you can do better than anyone else. There is some line of work in which you can excel, if you will just find that one thing and spend all your time and effort in learning to do it supremely well. Don't worry if it seems to be some humble thing that anyone ought to be able to do. 
In a magazine some time ago, there was the story of a Polish immigrant who could speak scarcely a word of English, who had no trade or training, and had to take any sort of job that offered. He happened to get one in a nursery, digging up dirt for the flowers. He dug so well that soon he was attending to the planting of many of the commoner varieties of flowers. Among these were the peonies. He loved those big peonies and gave them such careful attention that they thrived and grew more beautiful than ever. Soon his peonies began to attract attention, the demand for them grew until he had to double and then quadruple the space devoted to them. Today he is half owner of that nursery. Two artists opened an office together, doing any kind of work they could get. One noticed that wherever he happened to do cartoons for people, the results were so effective that they came back for more. So he made an especial study of cartoon drawing. Today his earnings are in the $25,000 class, while his fellow artist is still barely making ends meet as a jack-of-all-trades. A retail clerk found that she had a special gift for satisfying complaining customers. She liked to straighten out the snarls that others had caused, and she did it so well that she soon attracted the attention of her employers. Today she is head of the complaint department. There is the switchboard operator with the pleasing voice, the reception clerk with a cheery smile, the salesman with a convincing manner, the secretary with a knack for saving the boss's time, and the drummer with a jolly manner. Every one of us has something. Find out what one thing you can do best, cultivate it, and you can be the biggest man in that line in the world. Success is where you are and within yourself. Don't try to imitate what someone else is doing. Develop what you have. There is something in you that will enable you to reach the top in some one line. Put the spotlight on your own characteristics, your own abilities. Find what you can do best, what people like you best for. Then cultivate that. When the great Comstock load was first discovered, a fortune was taken out of it. Then the or petered out. The owners presently gave up and sold out to a new group. These men spent several hundred thousand dollars in a fruitless attempt to locate the rich load, and they too were ready to give up. But someone thought to try a borehole to the side of one of the entries, and struck an almost solid mass of or so rich that nearly three hundred million dollars was taken from it. In the early days of the prairie farms, newcomers were frequently able to buy for a song the homesteads of the original settlers because the latter had been able to find no water. They had dug wells, but had been unable to reach the streams beneath. Oftentimes, however, by digging only a few feet further, the newcomers found water in abundance. The first settlers had quit when success was almost within their grasp. The greatest success usually comes from one step beyond the point where defeat overtook you. He who loses wealth loses much, says an old proverb. He who loses a friend loses more. But he who loses his courage loses everything. Three things educators try to instill into children. First, knowledge. Second, judgment. Third, persistence. And the greatest of these is persistence. Many a man has succeeded without education. Many even without good judgment. But none has ever got anywhere worthwhile without persistence. Without a strong desire, without that inner urge which pushes him on, over obstacles, through discouragements, to the goal of his heart's desire. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence, said Calvin Coolidge. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan press on has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Russell Conwell, the famous educator and lecturer who founded Temple University, gathered statistics some years ago on those who succeeded, and his figures showed that of 4,043 multimillionaires in this country at that time, only 69 had even a high school education. They lacked money, they lacked training, but they had the urge to get somewhere, the persistence to keep trying, and they succeeded. Compare that with the figures Conwell gathered on the sons of rich men. Only one in seventeen died wealthy. Lacking incentive and having no urge within them to get ahead, they not only failed to make their mark, but they lost what they had. The first essential to success is a feeling of lack, a need, a desire for something you have not got. It is the powerlessness of the cripple or invalid that makes him long for strength and gives him the necessary persistence to work for it until he gets it. It is the poverty and misery of their existence that makes the children of the ghetto long for wealth and gives them the persistence and determination to work at anything until they get it. You need that same urgent desire, that same determination and persistence if you are to get what you want from life. 
You need to realize that whatever it is you want in life, it is there for the taking. You need to know that you are a cell in the God mind and that through this God mind, you can put the whole universe to work, if necessary, to bring about the accomplishment of your desire. But don't waste that vast power on trifles. Don't be like the fable of the woodsman who, having worked long and hard for the wishing fairy and accomplished the task she set him, was told that he might have and reward any three things he asked for. Being very hungry, he promptly asked for a good meal. That eaten, he noticed that the wind was blowing up cold, so he asked for a warm cloak. With his stomach full and a warm cloak about him, he felt sleepy, so he asked for a comfortable bed to lie upon. And so, with every good thing of the world his for the asking, the next day found him with only a warm cloak to show for his labors. Most of us are like that. We put the mountain in labor just to bring forth a mouse. We strive and strain and draw upon all the powers that have been given us to accomplish some trifling thing that leaves us just where we were before. Demand much. Set a worthwhile goal. Remember the old poem by Jesse B. Rittenhouse from the Door of Dreams, published by Houghton Mifflin Company Boston. I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more. However, I begged in the evening when I counted my scanty store. For life is a just employer, he gives you what you ask, but once you have set the wages, why, you must bear the task. I worked for a menial's hire, only to learn, dismayed, that any wage I had asked of life, life would have paid. Don't you be foolish like that. Don't bargain with life for a penny. Ask for something worth putting the universe to work for. Ask for it and demand it, then stick to that demand with persistence and determination until the whole God mind has to bestir itself to give you what you want. The purpose of life from the very beginning has been dominion, dominion over every adverse circumstance. And through his part of dominion, his nerve cell in the mind of God and his ability through it to get whatever action he may persistently demand, man has dominion over everything. There is a spark of divinity in you. What are you doing to fan it into flame? Are you giving it a chance to grow, to express itself, to become an all-consuming fire? Are you giving it work to do? Are you making it seek out ever greater worlds to conquer? Or are you letting it slumber neglected, or perhaps even smothering it with doubt and fear? And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Do you know what the unpardonable sin in all of nature is? Read the following chapters, and you will see. Affirmation, and every morning I will say, there's something happy on the way. And God sends love to me. God is the light of my life, the source of my knowledge and inspiration. God in the midst of me knows. He provides me with food for my thoughts, ideas for excellent service, clear perception, divine intelligence.